All right, it is two o'clock. Uh, welcome back. We are ready to begin our next session. Again, I'm Wade Matthews, Bureau of Utah Manager, and it's my privilege to uh, moderate our next session today. I wasn't ready. Lessons learned from an earthquake, things you don't think about. Um, our presenter today is Jeff Johnson. Um, Jeff works for the Utah Department of Public Safety Division of Emergency Management, and he's been there for 13 years. Jeff is the state coordinator for the School Readiness Program, and he's also the Division of Emergency Management's safety officer, as well as the safety officer for the State Emergency Operations Center. Jeff has also uh, retired law enforcement uh, for 25 years in uh, law enforcement. And uh, I'm sure he's got some exciting stories to tell you a little bit about some experiences in uh, earthquakes. So we uh, are, are excited to hear those. Jeff will also be joined by two panelists during our question and answer period at the end of the presentation. He'll be joined by Marilyn Hoff. Uh, some of you may know her as the earthquake lady. She is with the Utah Department of Public Safety, D Division of Emergency Management since 1994. She travels all over the state, presenting to various groups of all types on emergency preparedness. She earned the Earthquake Lady title in April 1997 by a group of students at Red Hills Middle School in Richfield, and she's uh, proud to carry that title ever since then. And then also John Crofts. He is currently the Utah Earthquake Program Manager, and he's been with Utah Division of Emergency Management for at least five years, previously serving as an operations manager for Salt Lake City for five years. Prior to that, he was Utah Flood Manager for 17 years. A lot of experience on our uh, with our presenter and panelists today. And with that, Jeff, I will turn it over to you for the presentation. And again, let me actually, let me just encourage people again, you know, please enter your questions in the chat. I'm sorry, Jeff, I think you have a slide about that too. Yeah, I do. Um, we wanna have uh, Marilyn and, and John help us at the end of this and, and answer your questions. So if you have any earthquake related questions or any preparedness related questions, submit them in the chat and Wade will monitor those while we go through this and we'll submit those to our panel at the end. Um, we also have a little bit of an audience poll here, Wade, if you could launch that, um, a couple of them. If you'd take a minute and uh, just help us out to know who our audience is. Oh, there we go. All right, thank you, yes. Have you ever been in an earthquake? Please, uh, please select one, yes or no. We have about 50% have uh, responded, about 60, almost 70% responded so far. We're at 70%, we'll give it about 15 more seconds. About 10 seconds. Anyone else want to answer the poll? We're about 70%. Three, two, one. All right. Poll is closed and there are your responses, Jeff. Can you see those? Yeah. Yeah. That's a uh that's a significant number that have been, not been in an earthquake. So <laughs> do you want to run the other one? Okay, the next one. Um, oh. Have you ever been in a larger earthquake, larger than 6.0 on the Richter scale? Those of you that uh, have been in an earthquake that responded yes previously, were you ever in a large quake, larger than six magnitude 6.0? We're about uh, almost 60% voted. Almost at 70% voted. Give it about 10 more seconds. 
five, three, two, one. All right, and there is the responses. Okay, so a few of you have been in a large earthquake, and that's that's something that we're going to talk about today. Is it, the ten things most people don't think about? Um, if you want to put the other screen back up, Wade, we'll chat a little bit about what most people don't think about when it comes to a large earthquake. And I'm really appreciative of the previous session. I hope you attended that because there were a lot of answers to the questions we face going through a very large earthquake. And, and there was some really great information in that previous session. Let's talk a little bit about earthquakes just to get started. Um, most people don't understand the Richter scale. What's the difference between a 5.0 and a 6.0? Well, it's a logarithmic base for you math heads uh, that understand log logarithmic um, calculations and, and equations which means it's the the uh, increments are multiplied by a factor of 10. What, what does that mean in English? Well, it means that a 5.1 earthquake has about 10 times greater shaking than a 5.0. A lot of th people will think that a 6.0 is just slightly larger than a 5.0, when actually that shaking would be uh, almost 100 times greater. So. And to put this in an example, an 8.6 magnitude quake, which does happen in the world, would not be twice as violent as a 4.3, but rather it would be 10,000 times worse. So a lot of discussion about our 5.7 uh, earthquake that was in Magna. They're still reevaluating what that is. Um, heard last week that it might have actually been a 5.3. 5.3 to 5.7, there's a lot of difference in the shaking, so understand that. I was in Japan for an LDS mission, and I served in the northern part of the, Hon uh, the main island, which is Honshu, and I served in the area called Tohoku. It was primarily farming country and very rural. It's that yellow area on the map, and while I was there, I, we found out that Japan was very, very seismic, uh, very active, and uh, if you remember back on March 11th of 2011, they had a 9.0 earthquake right off the coast of Tohoku, right in the same area. I went through several 4.0 earthquakes, a 5.5, a 6.5, and a 7.7. I'm going to talk a little bit about the differences in those. The fours just rattle stuff in your house. You just end up with things in your home being shaken around, and, and maybe it might even drop some pictures off your wall, but it's not real serious. We happen to be in a Japanese public bathhouse, which is an extremely hot water bath that you can go soak in. Yeah, we were there in January, and a 4.3 earthquake happened. Four of us Americans, they call us guy jeans over there, four of us guy jeans were in the in that hot bath with two Japanese guys when an earthquake started. Uh, it was a small one, 4.3. Four, four, 4 and it started the water sloshing in the bathtub, and the two Japanese guys jumped out, grabbed a towel, and were looking down at the rather um, dumb Americans still staying in the bathtub. And we decided it was time to get out. The water in the bathtub was sloshing so hard it swept us off our feet and we ended up going underwater in that really hot water. We finally just grabbed, I grabbed hold of the edge of the, and rolled out onto the ground. And I remember the first thing I saw looking up was this Japanese guy looking at me like I was the dumbest thing he'd ever seen. And so that's the kind of thing we're gonna talk about today. You, you need to know what to do during an earthquake. During the 5.5, I was in Yonazawa, which is in central Japan wasn't on the coast. And when that one started, I, I was on the second floor of our building, two-story building, and I ran over to the window and looked out. That was a dumb thing to do, but it gave me a view of what was happening outside. I got to watch shingles slide off people's houses, the stone shingles they have in Japan. And the interesting thing is I got to look down the road and for about three blocks and the, and the ground was just like the ocean, just waving. And it was, it was those S waves that happened. And it just makes makes the whole ground become like the ocean. I was in that same place for a 6.5, but we were 30 kilometers away from the epicenter. We were a long ways away. We didn't feel any of the P waves. If you look at this graph on the right side, that very violent shaking that goes up and down at the first part of the earthquake is the P waves and actually does uh, a significant most of the damage. We didn't, and in the 6.5, we didn't feel any of those. We were too far away, but we were all at the kitchen table, and when it happened, we stood up, and the whole building was just rocking like you were on the ocean. 
I went back to the East Coast uh, to a little town called Ishinomaki and was there for a 7.7 earthquake. And, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. This seismograph that's up here on the right side of the screen is uh, the, the seismograph from that earthquake. And you can see that there's a very intense period of shaking. It's like when somebody has a building side sledgehammer hitting your building. Before that shaking occurs, you can see there's a little bit of shaking that's, that ramps up to that. We're going to talk about that. And then after the P waves stop, the S waves start, and that's during the rolling period. You can see above the graph, there's those one minute marks that show you how long the shaking actually occurred. So the violent shaking was 15 to 20 seconds. Um, the serious shaking lasted the better part of a minute. And you can see as that continues off to the right side, the shaking continued for several minutes. The ground was just rumbling. And, and vibrating and, and there was noise. So let's talk about the quake. It was um, off the east coast of the Miyagi prefecture. If you look at the little map down on the left side, that pink area is the Miyagi area. Uh, it, it caused 28 deaths and 1,325 injuries and about $800 million in damage. And it also damaged or destroyed, dropped all of the bridges in my city. There were no bridges that withstood it, and there were 56 buildings that either collapsed or were in the process of collapsing. And so there was a lot of a lot of help that could be provided, and that's what we did in the days following this. What did I learn? Well, the first thing I learned is you're going to hear an earthquake before it strikes, unless you're really close to the epicenter. And the larger the earthquake, the larger the sound. It's it's going. You're going to hear it coming before it it strikes. How long? This is a second or two, and maybe three. Um, every one of these earthquakes that I was in, we heard this large rumbling that was like a train or a large truck approaching. And everybody either turns and looks at it, uh, turns and faces it, or says, what is that, and looks that way. And, and you'll hear this momentarily. The good thing about this, if you're earthquake savvy, this may give you a second or two to drop cover and hold on, or at least to look around the room for something to get underneath. And that's what you want to train yourself to do. You want to train yourself to drop cover and hold on. Um, we were less than 10 kilometers from the earthquake. I put a red dot on the map here, kind of showing where it was in Japan. Let me tell you a little bit about what happened. We first heard the noise coming. And because I'd been through a 5.5 and a 6.5, and they hadn't really scared me, I was not, those, those two earthquakes were nowhere near life-threatening. They were unnerving. They rattled you, but you didn't almost uh, die in the quake or, or come think you were going to die. So when this earthquake started, it was larger and we heard it longer before it struck. And we all turned in the room, there were four of us. We'd just come back from playing tennis across the street. It was our P-Day, our preparation day. And we were all in shorts, t-shirts and very sweaty. That becomes very significant later on that we were quite sweaty before this all happened. We heard the noise and, and I was sitting on the couch and because I thought it was another earthquake coming, I assumed my best bull riding position on the couch. I reached down between my legs and grabbed the couch and put my other hand over my head. And right about that time, the first P waves hit and it threw me on the ground. And I stood up and it threw me on the ground again. And in this size of an earthquake, you're going nowhere. If you think you're going to run somewhere, trust me, the furniture and the shaking are gonna keep you from going anywhere. The couch then came out from behind me and knocked me to the floor again. The third time I ended up on the floor, I thought, well, that's a good place to stay, but I was frightened. Uh, our windows then broke. Um, there were four large four foot by 30 inch windows uh, on the north side of the building. And at the first moment, two of those broke out. And I, I had long enough to think, man, I'm glad that glass broke outward when the center window broke in and shattered glass all over the room. At that moment, a table comes sliding across the room. It's about a five foot by three foot table, wooden with wooden square legs, and it slammed into the wall right next to me. And I just thought that's a good place to be. And I climbed underneath the table. And what do you think happened? Yeah, the table immediately headed the other way across the room because I hadn't grabbed hold of it. So now I'm crawling across the tatami mats and some of the broken glass trying to get back underneath the table. I managed to grab both front legs of that table and hook my ankles kind of on the back legs. And now I'm sliding back and forth 
um, on this on the, uh, during this earthquake. And this is during the real violent shaking part. It all happened, like I said, in 20 or 30 seconds. My companion crawled over and tried to climb underneath the table with me. And I said, what do you think I said? I said, get your own table. <laughs> well, um, there were no other tables and he knew that and I knew that. He looked around for a minute and then ended up climbing in on top of me. And that's where we ended up writing out the most of the of the S waves that came through. There was a sliding door between the living room we were in and the kitchen and it kept slamming open and shut and it kind of in a way that it gave us snapshots of what was happening in the kitchen. And the first thing I remember seeing is in that about eight foot by 10 foot kitchen, our food wasn't just flying out and hitting the floor. It was flying across the room and slamming into the opposite wall. And it, everything in the room was being launched around in the air. And the table was sliding from side to side and the refrigerator had walked out as far as they, as the power cord would let it go. And it was rocking back and forth drunkenly and we'd get snapshots of this as the door slammed open and shut. Um, as the shaking subsided, um, we stood up and I, I can tell you, we were in shock. Um, this had scared us. Uh, I had wondered if I was gonna survive it. Um, when you're laying on a floor and you're bouncing off of the floor that you're laying on, uh, you realize this is quite a serious earthquake. Everything was in disarray. Um, the refrigerator had tipped over, dumped everything out inside the refrigerator, and then basically satanically jumped up and down on everything that used to be our food and dishes and, and actually destroyed one of the chairs in the room. Um, we started what everybody did. We went outside and looked up and down the street where everybody was outside looking up and down the street. You can still feel the ground rumbling. You can still feel the shaking going on. Uh, this, like I said, this continued for a couple of minutes, and we started to take an assessment of our of our building and what our damage was. The one thing I didn't do spontaneously, the one thing I didn't do with some education was drop cover and hold on during this earthquake, and that's something uh, that we need to talk about today. Reactions of violence uh, shaking like this, um, this sudden violent shaking, vary. Uh, some people freeze. Um, one of the elders was in the room. There were four of us that were there, uh, hit the floor and didn't move. He ended up uh, holding onto a piece of the wall and that's where he stayed. Some people run, some people panic. The thing is you need to learn to practice getting underneath something sturdy. And that needs to happen fairly quickly because the ceiling panels were falling out and things were tipping over and you need to be underneath something. So, well, you need to prepare yourself for an earthquake. Your brain doesn't work really well for those kind of things. And and you need to understand that there are a lot of things happening simultaneously during an earthquake like this. So one of the things you need to realize is that furniture will move. Um, most people don't anticipate that. Most people don't. Oops, let me see if I can get this back. There we go. Most people don't. Uh, hold on to things or try to get under something. And most people don't anticipate that in in a large earthquake, a large magnitude earthquake, furniture just moves around the room. Uh, in our earthquake, it was going from wall to wall. And the only reason the table stayed where it was is because we grabbed hold of it and got underneath it. And you got to realize the moving furniture, furniture can injure you. So understand that. Um, you can end up getting injured in these in these earthquakes. Uh, if you're in the kitchen, you can't deal with the large appliances moving around like that. And uh, like I said, they'll move to the end of their cord and then snap that and, and keep moving. And so get out of the kitchen. That's a very unsafe place. Um, probably not a good place to stay underneath the table in the kitchen if the refrigerator is gonna fall over on it. So fourth thing I learned is utilities will be out. And this was the significant part of the next couple months of, of my life. Um, you can plan on power and water, gas, phones, all being out. Uh, our power was out for 28 days, and that was the first thing that came back on. Our streets looked like this picture, um, and not just a street. As far as you could walk or ride a bike, you could find uh, all the power lines had snapped and come down. Our water was out 35 days. This became incredibly significant as well and, and stressing uh, because as missionaries, we didn't keep much food or water around. Uh, when the water did come back on, it was very low pressure. When you took a shower, it was this little stream that came down. And that is 
all you get out of it. But you also learn some very interesting things like if you don't have very good water pressure, don't use very much soap or shampoo. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to get out of your hair. It's hard to get off of you if you have very low water pressure. Our gas was out 41 days, which the first warm shower I took after almost uh, six weeks was quite um, a marvelous experience. If you go six weeks taking cold showers or not even having a bath, well, we're gonna talk about bathing here in a second. Our phone did come back about three days after the power, but that was really insignificant for us. There wasn't a whole lot of people we could call. So they did let us make a call home and tell our parents we were okay. We're always told help is on the way, and there are some realities with this. We, we, we're here to have a 72-hour kit, and that help will be there in 72 hours. In a really severe earthquake like this or any major disaster, help may be longer than three days away. Realize that. You may not see these nice fire trucks rolling up and down your street looking to, to provide help because they're going to be so busy at the building collapses and the refinery fires and all of the major incidents that occur. Uh, you know, they're going to be at the schools and the hospitals and places where there's severe damage. And they just might not be driving around your neighborhood. So California tells their residents that it will be one week before the government agencies will be in your neighborhood. And that's probably a sense of reality. You might uh, be fixing and doing everything on your own for about a week. So realize even as a week, your utilities will probably be out much longer. You're not going to have any water, power, or gas after a major earthquake like this. And, and like a, we went, you know, four, five, and six weeks before those came back to us. And I think that is a reality uh, if the damage is severe. Water main ruptures, um, realize that if studies show that if you live in a sloped area or a liquefaction area, which is a lot of the Wasatch Front, that it might be easier to replace the pipes than locate and repair all the breaks that occur in sloped and liquefaction areas. And realize to do that, it might take 12 to 18 months. And you're going to be thinking about how to get water to your house or how to store water at your house and use water at your house uh, if, if those pipes are broken. Water is a key. Um, the fifth thing we learned is that um, you, you, you start to suffer very quickly if there is no water. We turned on our water tap. And I'm going to tell you right now, after an earthquake, do not turn on your water tap. We turned it on to see if there was water and it ran clear for a couple seconds and then turned kind of a brownish gold color and then a black sludge came out. Why? Well, underground pipes. The water pipes run right next to the sewer pipes. And if both of those are broken in the same location, you get cross contamination. And that's what we had. But what we did was we drew sewage into our um, pipes and then let it set there for um, five weeks because there was no way to get it out. And that created another contamination problem. So you got to realize not having any water. This happened on Monday evening and we had no water. Uh, nobody came with any water or no, we didn't see anybody with water during this time. And uh, we had uh, we had no water. We weren't real thirsty at first. I don't remember being that. But on Wednesday night at about 6 p.m., there was a truck that was driving down about a block and a half perpendicular to our houses and it had great big tires and wheels on it. Knew it was from the government, first people we'd seen. And uh, I ran down there and they were handing out boxes. I had no idea when I ran up what was in the boxes, but being a disaster, I wanted one of the boxes. Turned out to be about three liters of water in a cardboard box with a plastic lining. And as I'd ran to, to the truck, I'd yelled to the guys in my uh, apartment building and I said, in the building we owned, or in and I said uh, there's a truck and I ran and well they came outside I'd gone around the corner they couldn't see where I went and I told the guy in the truck there was four of us and he said no he looked around there's one of you and I said no, no there's four of us he goes no there's one of you and he gave me one box and they drove off so I walked back on Wednesday night with one box of about three three and a half liters of water and we we got our first drink we went again till Friday uh, with no water all day Thursday, there was no water to be found. And we actually uh, stumbled around a corner about 10 blocks from where we lived and there was a Red Cross station set up and they had rice balls and cups of water out on the table. 
Now, I realize only having one drink since Monday night all the way to Friday, we were quite thirsty and I walked over and started picking up little cups of water and drinking them one after another till a cow came over and said, oh, no, 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 you can only have one. And all four of us had drank about three by that time. And that was the, really the first water we had got since Monday night, except for that box on Wednesday. Um, water started being supplied at that point of distribution uh, on Friday afternoon, and they told us to bring a container. There's your, there's your third problem with, with water. How do you carry water to your house? You need to have ways to do that. If they start bringing in big semi trucks with water, how do you get the water from that point to your house? We went back to our house and rounded up every little bucket we could find. And when they weren't five gallon buckets, they were smaller. And we used, we cleaned those out the best we could. And as we got some fresh water, we used those to clean those buckets. And we carried open top buckets to our house. So food, like I said, our food was pulverized uh, during with uh, glass during the earthquake. There were no cans. It was all fresh food. Uh, it was packaged in bags and, and boxes. And what happened in the earthquake is all that broken glass and that got mixed in. Since we weren't hungry on Monday night, we went and got a snow shovel and a broom. We shoveled all that glass, broken glass from the windows and the plates and our, on our glasses and all the food into the garbage can. And that may have been a mistake because we maybe could have salvaged some of that, but we were so worried about the food being impregnated with glass and, and ingesting broken glass that we just shoveled it up and threw it in the garbage can. We made it to the grocery store just after dark that night on Monday night and the shelves were empty. As we walked through the store, there was nothing but toothpicks and things like that left. All the food had been taken. And you need to realize, um, this, this continues for quite some time after the earthquake. Uh, there is no way to resupply these stores immediately. There were large piles of destroyed food on the floor and we kind of looked those over a little bit and decided against that again, not being very hungry on Monday night. And uh, the other problem you have is if you don't have food, you get very hungry and you get very thirsty. Wednesday night, we were again at our garbage can looking through what we'd shoveled in there. And we decided uh, this is just not a good idea. We'd taken a bad situation and made it impossible. So Thursday morning, luckily, there's a little mise. These Japanese rural areas have these little stores all over. They look like this picture. The people who own them live upstairs and the bottom floor is a store and it has maybe two rows of, of, of grocery food. And the neighbor who had this little mise, this little neighborhood store brought over to us on Thursday morning, a half a loaf of bread, dried rice cakes, and, and some broccoli. Now we knew we might not get more food later, so we sat down and had a discussion. Do you ration this or you, do you eat it? It has now been two and a half days since you've had any food and you're hungry. And I would love to run up a poll question on this. We just don't have time. But um, we sit and talked about it for a minute. We let everybody decide for themselves when we all ate the food because we were hungry. Food sporadically, it started showing up sporadically. You could get it at distri points of distribution the second week, but realize um, because of the damage to the roads, we're going to talk about that in a minute, and the damage to the infrastructure, this was not quick coming back. And the other problem is the banks are closed. There is no power. And so what kind of cash do you have on hand? Because everything is cash and carry. Uh, and until the banks get their power back up, they really didn't start distributing money until they could keep records of that. The second disaster they hit was toilet paper. You know, everybody's been made cognizant of toilet paper during the pandemic, but this has not been a common occurrence during the last decades as I've gone out and talked about this. And I'm glad people are, are toilet paper aware now. But we ran out of toilet paper five days after the earthquake. And let me tell you, that's a secondary disaster. What do you do? So in the first few weeks, there was paper to be found strewn on the streets, much like this. And you got to be a very good paper connoisseur, uh, deciding which paper was the appropriate paper that might make good toilet paper. And so you went out picking toilet paper up everywhere you could. And at first we didn't start stockpiling it because we kept thinking that the toilet paper would get back to the stores in five days, in three days, in a week. That didn't happen either. Um, and not only that, this, this paper started to disappear for two reasons. One, everybody else was doing the same thing we were doing once their toilet paper ran out. And the, third, the second thing was um, people were just cleaning up the neighborhood after the earthquakes. And 
after the earthquake happened. And so toilet paper, the random toilet paper started to disappear. And the sort of source stocks didn't return for eight weeks. So we we hunted toilet paper every day for eight, almost eight weeks. Bathing becomes a huge issue. Um, how much water do you store? Uh, Post-earthquake environments are filthy. Um, you are shoveling, you're sweeping, you're hauling, you're stacking, you're helping people clean up after the earthquake. And, and you get dirt in places you didn't know you could get dirt. You just do. You just get dirt. And you get really dirty. So after five days, we went out to this little koi pond, this little fish pond. Now, we had no fish in it, nor did we tend it at all while it was in our backyard. But we went out there, and all was in it was rainwater. And it was stagnant pond water that had collected in that over time, over a year or more. And we picked that up, put some of that in our hand, and smelled it. And if you've ever smelled really stagnant pond water, we said, nope, not taking a bath in this. So we went down to the ocean, and our first clue at the ocean should have been nobody was there. Uh, the beaches were empty. But one of the elders ran in the water, and he looked down around his shins. We'd taken a towel and some soap and shampoo with us, figured the ocean was better than nothing, as dirty as we were. He ran in the ocean, and all he looked down, and he had colored paper stuck all around his shins. And it was at that point we realized that the beach was covered with toilet paper and feces because the sewage plant, which was six blocks up the coast, had had broken pipes and had dumped 15 million gallons of raw sewage into the ocean. So we got out of that, walked about a mile to the river. When we got there, it had a rainbow sheen on it. We asked a police officer, what's wrong with the river? And he said, oh, some fishing boats that were in dry dock capsized up the river, and there's tens of thousands of gallons of diesel in the river. So we went back and stayed dirty on that fifth day. On the ninth day, we decided we had to do something. So we went out to that stagnant koi pond water and we took a bucket two buckets actually and we strained the water between two sheets and we got all the floaties out of it and got it down to kind of a burnt orange color and we took a bath in that water with just sponge cloths with and, and towels and soap standing out in our backyard we didn't smell better but we were cleaner and the good thing was we all smelled the same so <laughs> But you're going to have to think about how you're going to bathe. Prepare ways to take a bath. Um, this is very, very important because if you just start drinking water, I can guarantee you, you're going to get dirty. So think about wipes, think about rainwater barrels, think about water sources you could use to bathe in and maybe store some water that at least in the first couple of weeks until points of distribution are set up, if you have broken pipes, that you can you can bathe yourself and clean yourself. Travel's difficult. The streets were busted up. The powder, power lines and poles were down like spider webs. Um, it was just a mess. In fact, on the very first night of the earthquake, I was riding along on my bike and got taken off of my bike by a power line that hit me right in the forehead that was slung low across. It was in the dark. But you got to realize the bridges are all down. The pavement's busted up and broken. Your streets look like this picture. There's large cracks. There's holes. Buildings collapse into the street. Those have created a problem like this house has slid into this street. It's everywhere. And travel becomes difficult. It is not easy to get around. You do a lot of walking. Bikes are okay. Can't drive a lot of places. And, and even though we had access to cars through some of the branch members, um, we didn't drive anywhere. The bridges were all down. Uh, this lasts for weeks and months because it's not something that's quickly prepared. So just keep in mind that your travel it isn't going to be what you think it's going to be. And it's a, there's a lot of walking involved. The last of the 10 things is weather. Um, our windows were all broken out. And we didn't replace those windows until mid-August to get all of them back in. So our building was completely exposed to the outside elements. Now, it was June 12th. So it was pretty warm days. We had ocean breezes that blew through the house all, all day. But have, I have always thought, had that been in January, what would we have done? Because our, if we'd have tried to run it off of our fuel that we had there to keep warm, it wouldn't have happened. It would have ran out. So whatever the temperature is outside, if you have no windows, that is what the temperature will be inside. So give some consideration to the weather and, and maybe ways to seal your house up or seal your home up from the outside. This is very important. It's one of the things we teach in shelter in place, but a lot of people don't apply it over to their earthquake preparedness. If your windows are all broken and it broken out, some duct tape and a lot of bisqueen or 
<clears throat> no, excuse me, or clear plastic sheeting would really be a good idea. So think about that. Jay Leno said, we are in a code orange and Homeland Security said earlier today that everyone should have a roll of duct tape and plastic sheeting to protect your house in the event of a terrorist attack. Who came up with this idea? MacGyver? No, I can tell you the people who came up with that idea are the people who've had to, to deal with the weather being inside their home. So in summary here, we'll get to our panel. You'll hear the earthquake before you feel it. And it may give you a moment to do something. Practice drop cover and hold on. It's not a natural reaction in a life-threatening crisis. You don't want to be crawling around on a glass strewn floor like I was. Furniture, objects will move. Consider your surroundings. If you get in the middle of an earthquake, I don't care if you're in your office building, if you're at home, you're at church, you're in the mall, realize things are going to move. Utilities will be out, and that's for an extended period of time. If people think you're going to have your power back in a week like we did after the windstorm, in an earthquake, I think it's going to take a lot longer. And water may even be longer. What's your sources of water? Think about rain barrels. Think about other ways to capture some water you can use for things besides drinking. Remember the fours. You can live four minutes without air. You can live four days without water. You can live four weeks without food. Water is something you need to have access to. The survival food. The grocery stores are going to be empty for an extended period of time. Have on hand what you need. Also, sanitation. How much toilet paper do you have? You might need eight weeks. We did. And then again, your your plumbing. Oh, there's a typo. The plumbing might be a problem as well. How do you bathe? Our water was out for 35 days and realize if your pipes are broken underground in some areas, it could be out for months. So give some consideration to that. Travel will be difficult. We just talked about this. It might take months or even longer to repair. And it's just not something that happens quickly. And finally, number 10, plan for the weather. This could happen in July or it could happen in January. And you need to be able to have a way to seal your house up if that happens to keep either the heat or the cold out. Sheets and plastic, plastic duct tape are the, are the best way to do that. Shrink wrap, some people have said they'll try to do that. Use a generator to, to, to shrink wrap it with some heat. You know, spray foam sealing in a can is priceless to seal cracks to keep the wind from blowing through and keeping your house sealed up. And if it's a cold part of the year, seal off, consider sealing off part of your home in cold weather months to just heat a small area. You know, I'm just asking you, are you ready? Um, do you know what to do? Broken windows, toilet paper, take a bath, empty grocery stores, drinking and bathing water. These are the things you need to think about that I think most people don't think about, and especially for an extended period of time when this starts the last three and five and seven weeks. Um, you, need to, you need to think about these things to be ready and help yourself. Remember, we heard this yesterday, and I'm going to repeat it again today. In a disaster, you don't rise to the occasion. You sink to your level of preparedness, and just remember that. And it's never too late to prepare. This is Brian Stinson's mantra. It's never too late until it is. So with that, I'm going to kick it back to Wade to talk about our questions. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Great job. Uh, well, yeah, we're going to invite John and Marilyn. You've got your cameras and microphones unmuted. Um, first question for Jeff, we'll just get right into them here. Um, uh, what can we use to bathe in? You talked about the koi pond. What else can we use to <laughs> bathe in, Bonnie asks. Oh, I would recommend you look around your area. Um, there are two large holding ponds within two blocks of my house, and there's water in those most of the year. But I'm also going to tell you to consider things like wipes. Um, a, a box of wipes, a package of wipes would have been priceless. There would have been absolutely no price you could have put on a box of wipes uh, to, to clean yourself up. So there are ways to bathe without water. Give those some consideration. Um, there are things called soap cloths that you can buy from the military. There are military grade things. And with one of those, you can bathe your whole body and you could, you could Google soap cloths and look those up. But know where water sources are in your neighborhood or even around where you work. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question for John. Um, uh, actually, there's kind of two questions here. Uh, can we experience or expect to experience a nine ma magnitude nine earthquake uh, here in Utah on the Wasatch Fault? 
John. Thank you. Thank you, Wade. That was a great question, and I'm glad you brought that up. And I think it's uh, an important question, especially given Jeff's presentation, which was excellent. And I loved hearing about the earthquake in Japan. So uh, Utah does not have a subduction zone earthquake area. So uh, Japan's in what they call the ring of fire, where there's uh, subduction zones all around the tectonic plates. Uh, the plates that we have in, well, the, the faults that we have in Utah are normal faults. So we have the um, possibility of having up to a magnitude seven earthquake. Um, when we had our earthquake in, um, the Magna earthquake on March 18th, we had the 5.7 earthquake, which the seismograph stations reported. And then uh, there was some bad information that went out on social media that said we were gonna have a magnitude nine earthquake. Well, first of all, there's no way you can predict a, a larger earthquake. Uh, we don't have the technology to predict what's gonna happen in the future at this point. So a magnitude nine earthquake was not possible, but that went out. And uh, luckily we had the, uh, a very cooperative media that was working to dispel that false rumor and, um, and get that corrected. So. You know, a magnitude nine earthquake is, you know, a large earthquake that Utah is just not capable of producing. So um, I'm glad that that question came up. Now in Japan, yes, there are magnitude nine earthquakes along the subduction faults or the su subduction zones, which would include Japan. And they had one in Chile. I believe the um, the whole city of Concepcion, Chile actually, actually shifted nine feet during their earthquake, the last one they had. So, um, you know, I, I think that uh, a magnitude seven earthquake can still cause significant damage and cause us a lot of grief. However, I don't think that we need to panic and worry about a magnitude nine. That just will not be possible in the state of Utah. Thank you, John. Next question for Marilyn. What if we do not have a desk or table, a chair to get underneath? What else can you do to kind of be safe in an earthquake, Marilyn? You're, you're muted, Marilyn. You need to unmute your microphone. St still not hearing you, I'm sorry. Try clicking the microphone up. It was muted by the organizers. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yes, that's another great question. If there is uh, no table, chairs to drop, cover, and hold, depends on where you're at. Um, quickly look around the inside solid walls if you're home. Of course, when you're home, there's tables and chairs, but if you're in an area with no table and chairs, go to the inside solid wall uh, or a solid corner and duck down and cover your head uh, to keep ceiling tiles, light fixtures from falling on you. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, next question actually for Marilyn. Um, flashlight, radio, those are good tools to put in your disaster supply kit, but what are the things would you recommend people do to you use the phrase, train your brain? How can people train their brain to be ready for an earthquake? You train your brain by preparing, and that's why we have people like Jeff and and uh, John, Wade, all of us, Be Ready Utah, even out, uh, Jonathan and Kyleen, I mean, great presentations. So you learn from uh, people's stories, just like Jeff's uh, amazing story. Uh, so we do learn. So by learning from other people's experience, uh, then you take action at home and uh, make your home safe due to falling furniture and uh, pictures, dishes, just pre uh, secure everything. And then have your emergency kit prepared, uh, ready to grab and go in case you receive a knock at the door that you and your family need to leave home because of uh, fire or any other reason in the area, then your kits are ready to grab and go. So the main thing is be prepared ahead. I mean, it goes on and on and on, but don't get caught without. Thank you, Marilyn. Next question for John. Uh, 
how do you tell the difference if there is a difference between a, an aftershock and an earthquake? Uh, and how long could we expect aftershocks, it, uh, generally speaking, I guess? That's a great question. So, you know, just going back on the recent experience of the March 18th earthquake that we had, the large earthquake was 5.7. And um, we had, uh, you know, several thousands aftershocks after that. And it didn't just occur for a day or a week. It, it continued for several weeks after. So um, typically, when you have an earthquake, um, you have aftershocks that decrease in magnitude after. You know, so if, if you have um, uh, a, a large event, you know, usually they look at the, the large event as the earthquake and everything else as the aftershock. So, um, you know, that, that was quite the panic when uh, it went out on social media that we were going to have a magnitude 9 earthquake after. And um, the chances of a larger earthquake happening after a major event are, are very minuscule. So that's pretty rare that you would have a larger event after. But, um, you know, as far as these aftershocks go on, they, they can continue on for weeks and months. And, um, in fact, we're still feeling, you know, minor aftershocks from that magna event and uh, over time the duration and the magnitude decreases wait oh, great you yes. want to pitch on that i just want to say one quick thing i think the the aftershock scared us worse than the actual earthquake the actual earthquake caught us off guard and when the aftershocks happened we had an aftershock happen of 6.5 in the in the at four o'clock in the morning you almost think the whole thing's starting all over again. And, and those aftershocks are never as big as the main event, usually. Uh, there's very rare ex exceptions to that. But I, I'm going to tell you right now, the aftershocks are an unnerving. They are very unnerving once you've been terrified by a very big earthquake. Thank you. OK, we've got just a, a minute left. So if we can make the last, we've got two more questions. If you can keep these brief. Um, Whoever wants to answer this one, are we really supposed to stay in bed if the earthquake comes at night, or do you try for the triangle of life? So, uh, Jeff, do you want to take that one really quickly? Yeah, um, they recommend staying in bed is a good place to be. Pull the covers over your head, pull the pillow over your head. Be cognizant if you have a large window next to that bed, that, that may create a problem if you have a broken window. Um, again, bed is not a bad place to be. If you can get under your bed, that might even be better. Um, if Marilyn wants to pitch in on this, I'll just say really quickly about the triangle of life. That is primarily a concept and principle used outside of you, the United States. Um, our, our construction here is so much better than most places that you don't have the pancaking of floors that pancake down and create those triangles. And so the drop, cover, and hold on uh, principle is far better to use here. And and it, But if you are in some place of really old or shoddy construction, you might want to think about the triangle of life. And you can look that up on the internet if you don't know what that is. But I'll throw that to John and, and Marilyn real quick. Great response, Jeff. I agree with you and thank you for responding. So I'll do what Jeff said. Okay, thank you. Lastly, for uh, John, uh, with the type of faults in Utah that we have, you've kind of described and answered this a little bit already, but will furniture move horizontally, violently like in Jeff's video, or what would a five mag magnitude five or six or seven earthquake be like here in Utah? You, we, we do some uh, uh, modeling, you know, maybe you can explain a little bit about what we expect through the modeling. Yeah, so the earthquake that we experienced was a 5.7 and, um, the, the data that came through on that, you know, indicated that it might have been a little bit smaller than that, but they already reported the 5.7, so that's what they were going with. But uh, depending on a 5.7 is much different than a, a 6.7, so it's, you know, it's, um, yes, furniture can move, things can uh, fall off shelves, and, you know, one thing that um, we were very fortunate on with this earthquake, uh, you know, we were, I, I guess the pandemic's not fortunate. The the one good thing about the pandemic is people were not in schools and they were not a build in in public buildings where uh, things were falling off the shelves and hitting mm -hmm. people. We didn't have one fatality, and I think that we can consider ourselves very lucky for that. So um, a five seven earthquake they consider that moderate. 
not large. Um, you know, a 6.57, that would be a large earthquake. And um, yes, furniture does move and uh, things fall and break. And I think that we can consider ourselves very fortunate that nobody lost their lives during this last earthquake. Marilyn, I think you're showing something there. I'll let yeah. you speak. I was sort of happy to have the March 2020 earthquake because to see if all my furniture would stay in place with a uh, furniture strap, with L-shaped brackets. Uh, you, there's all types of hardware out there to secure your heavy furnishing and it, things do not need to fall. Uh, your, um, you can get straps to secure your flat screen TVs freestanding. So there's so many things that you can do throughout your home to make it safe due to earthquake movement to protect your family. Thank you all very much. We are out of time now. I appreciate everyone's participation. Marilyn Hoff, the Earthquake Lady, John Crofts, Earthquake Program Manager, and Jeff Johnson, our Safety Officer and School Preparedness for the Division of Emergency Management. We are, uh, appreciate all of those answers and responses and training today. Uh, we are going into enter a break now, but we do have a video of, uh, from one of our sponsors, Be Ready Utah and uh, turn up the volume on your computer to hear this, but uh, we will be. Hey. Yeah? Did you know that in an emergency, local phone lines are probably gonna be jammed? But long distance numbers might still actually work. Really? Yeah. So last night we called and asked my Aunt Mabel in Colorado be our out-of-state emergency contact. If something happens now, all well, my family's gonna text her and let her know that we're okay. Huh. I should do that. All right, Kathy, thank you for playing that video for us, uh, produced uh, by Brian uh, Stinson from the Be, uh, Be Ready Utah program of the Division of Emergency Management, one of a few of the uh, commercials that we have on the Be Ready Utah YouTube channel at youtube.com slash user slash Be Ready Utah. You can go watch that video again there at the uh, Be Ready Utah YouTube channel, as well as some of our other um public service announcements, commercials, which are meant to emphasize the importance of any time is a good time to talk about emergency preparedness and uh, share that. Any time is a good time to share that information with other people. And that's what helps people just uh, take action towards preparedness. Go home and talk about that and share that with others.